Everybody's got a price, it's the million dollar man What's up, everybody? It's Marcus D'Angelo, and we're back for another episode of Everybody's Got a Pod. And of course, I'm joined by the Million Dollar Man, the Hall of Famer, and the guy who's here to answer your questions today. It's Ted DiBiase. Ted, what's going on, brother? Uh, everything is, you know, uh, I feel like a million bucks. <laughs> you look like a million bucks. Whatever you're doing, uh, yeah, keep on I mean, doing it. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting to be an old fart, you know, kind of like. But. Uh, you know, as you get older, you're, 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 I found that your skin thins, right? Mm-hmm. And so, like, all I have to do is, like, if I just brush by something, you know, it's like if I'm out in the, in the yard and my wife's got, uh, you know, she's got rose bushes and stuff, you know, with the, with the stickers. Mm-hmm. If I just brush by one of those, I'm bleeding. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> dude, I don't have to do anything anymore. Anyway, yeah. You're getting old late for sissies, I'm going to tell you that. I know you bruise easier and stuff. Just imagine yeah. how you'd look after a match with like Stan Hansen nowadays. Oh my! You'd be head to toe oh, black and blue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, today, Ted, <clears throat> we're letting our listeners get, take control of the podcast. It's okay. our it's our third edition of Ask Ted Anything. Uh, you put it out on social media, and your fans delivered some unbelievable yeah. questions. Uh, can't wait to get into it. Before okay. we do. You all know my gimmick by now. I've got to remind you guys to get over to YouTube at youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. If you're enjoying the show, which I know that a lot of you are really, really enjoying it and are subscribing, and we appreciate all of you. But if you're enjoying the show and you haven't subscribed on YouTube yet, you're missing out. We have exclusive stories, stories that you won't hear anywhere else, only on YouTube for our YouTube exclusives that come out every Monday. Also, we're planning on doing another, another giveaway sometime soon. Check this out. Found this guy at Walmart. I'm about to send it over to Ted. He's going to sign it, and we're going to do a giveaway with it. So, guys, all you have to do to be eligible is subscribe on YouTube. Again, it's youtube.com slash at everybody's got a pod. We appreciate everybody who's over there now. Let's continue to grow that page. The more it grows, the more stuff we're going to give away. And, uh, man, there's a lot of fun going on over there. So, Ted, without any further ado, you ready to roll? I'm ready to roll. You know, that, that action figure that you just showed I was in Walmart with my grandkids. You know, the company never tells me, you know, that they're 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 making that stuff or anything. Mm-hmm. You know, and so uh, and so uh, my grandson's name's Eli, one of them, and he said he comes over and gets me. He goes, they they don't call me grandpa. They call me Big. Everybody calls me Big. That's my nickname. Hey, Big. Hey, Big. Big, come here. You got, you got to see this. And he says. If, 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 if I'm right, it's you. <laughs> so uh, he takes me over to where the toys are. And sure enough, and I mean, that's the first time I laid eyes on it. I didn't even know they had come out with a new figure. So anyway. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So they, they don't even tell you, they don't ship you any, none of that. Well, you know, it's kind of like you call them and ask them. It's uh, kind of like, okay, uh, you know, that new figure you got, I mean, uh, can you send me a box? Yeah. <laughs> It's got to be pretty surreal for you to, you know, have wow. your grandchild come up to you with an action figure of you. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, let's go back. I mean, way, you know, before, I mean, before Vince went to national and global and, 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 and the WWE became as big a deal as it has, um, you know, I never imagined that in, in my, you know, you know, wrestlers didn't, you know, we, we weren't action figures ever before. So the first time I went into, and I, I think it was at Walmart, and I saw my own action figure, I was just blown away. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Did you buy one? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know that some guys. Uh, I, some called the them and I, I, I called them, and I called the office then. I said, hey, you know that new action figure you got? You, can you send me one? I said, yeah, we, we will. That's, so, that's better than having to buy one. Sure. Um, I know that a lot of the guys have like, you know, and most of them keep them in storage, but even guys from your era have like tubs of just toys of themselves, t-shirts, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did yeah, you wind up it, keeping any of that? And well, yeah, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got t-shirts and, uh, you know, um, like a slew of the action figures. Now there's, I don't know, there's a bunch of them. So, 
yeah they've uh, by now it's got it's got to be hundreds of them that they've made of you so there's a new one coming out soon from mattel so guys keep your eyes on that because uh it's got modern day ted and it's got ted from like the 80s on there so oh, pretty boy. cool action figure man it's you're just yeah, as relevant it's as like ever. an action figure with me and wearing glasses right <laughs> yes uh, that's the one it's like you know it's like nxt whatever. ted <laughs> yeah <laughs> whatever <laughs> hey man if they're still making toys of you you did something uh, right yeah yeah i guess so <laughs> all right let's get right. into these questions uh going broadway podcast asks what is your favorite match from mid-south that you were part of and what about your favorite match from japan that you were part of uh wow mid-south um yeah i mean i spent so much time in mid-south but you know i i think probably uh, the the match I got like I got a kick a kick out of is the way that the way that Bill Watts turned me heel. Oh my gosh, you talk about heat! <laughs> oh wow, uh, you know Watts was he was just so good. I mean, we could have done it, you know, uh, you know any any other way, but for you know it's kind of like that whole scenario where you see him being you know, taking care of his friend and not wanting to win a match like that. Uh, to me, you know, you know, becoming the, becoming the, becoming the asshole. <laughs> Man, we watched it last week here on Everybody's Got a Pod. If you missed that episode about JYD, it was our 11th episode. Go back into the archives and check it out. We did a watch along with that moment and it is just yeah. a blast. So please yeah. go out of your way to see that. What about in Japan, Ted? What is your favorite match from your time in Japan? Gosh, you know, uh, you know, now I, I eventually became uh, Stan Hansen's tag team partner. And just for the fans who don't know, Japan, you know, Japan ha has a, it's a, they had their own wrestling entity in the, you know, and uh, it's, you know, uh, it's not part of WWE, never has been. Uh, and they had two organizations, All Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, which was the original uh wrestling uh, i mean i think and this is like way back when i was 12 i think my dad went to japan one time on a six-week tour and uh that, that was when pro wrestling was starting in japan anyway um so i i go over there for all japan pro wrestling and um and then eventually uh another company with the the, the guy's name was anoki he broke away from all Japan and created new Japan pro wrestling. Uh, but I always, I always stuck with all Japan, you know, loyalty is a big thing over there. And um, so, um, you know, one of their top guys and I met him while I was still in college playing football. Cause again, the funks were the, the, the funk family basically were the guys booking talent for for Japan to bring over. And so yes. they had a really close relationship. So one of the guys that they sent to, to Amarillo, the Amarillo territory, uh, uh, was this guy who had actually, uh, uh, his name was Taruda, Jumbo Taruda. Okay. You know, he, you know, he had an amateur background, you know, he wrestled, he wrestled for Japan in the Olympics. And he, he was a legit, real, you know, real wrestler, but a, a, but it ended, ended up turning into a great worker. Um, and so, but I met him over here when he was wrestling for the Funks. And uh, then when I went to Japan, uh, it was a memorable match for me because we had become friends. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know, you know, I was going to go to Japan on, on, on a tour, whatever it was. I think this was a five-week week tour. And, um, but you know, he, what he did for me in a match, he didn't have to do. I mean, he really made me over there. And so here's, here's one of their biggest stars and he has a match with me that, you know, he's, he's, he basically, he, he got me over in one match. I mean, he, he made the, the wrestling fans in Japan respect my ability and it was, uh, it was something he didn't really have to do, and it's it's just something I'll never forget. Uh, uh, but then, you know, I guess another mem memorable match for me would be tagging with Stan Hansen and us winning the, uh, you know, 
you know, uh, the Japan version of the world tag team title. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I, those are, those are two on the top of my list. Man, can't wait to talk about your days in Japan. That's coming up here very, very soon on the podcast. So everybody stay tuned. I know a lot of fans online have been clamoring for your all Japan days, and I promise we will get there. Uh, Mark Rebman asks, when did you first get wind of Leroy McGurk's plot to take you out that Jim Ross talked about in his book? So, Ted, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know that all of our listeners know the backstory on this. Can you tell the full story? Okay. Um, so I go and I start wrestling in the summer of 75 uh, for Bill Watts in, in that territory. Now, you know, Bill Watts and Leroy McGurk had become partners and now, and I don't know, I don't know all the background of that, but I know obviously, and, and uh, Bill Watts played football at the University of Oklahoma. And so he was an athlete, you know, and he had got in the, in the business and, and, and he's a brilliant guy. And so he's now like partners with Leroy McGurk. And at the time, at the time, um, I guess when he first went to work for Leroy, uh, Leroy McGurk's territory. I mean, I can remember back when, when I was with my mom and dad and I was like, um, I was like in the first, I don't even know if I was in the first grade yet. But I remember that we stayed in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a summer. And all I can remember is this, this, this house that we rented had this big yard with a huge hedge over it. Anyway, it's funny the things you remember. But anyway, <laughs> I remember that. That was, that was for Leroy McGurk. That's the first time I ever heard of Leroy McGurk, you know. And, uh, and of course, by this time, you know, he, he was already, you know, blind, couldn't see. Um, and so, you know, like fast forward, I go, you know, we go, I grow up and, and then I go back to, you know, my first shot at wrestling, uh, because Dick Murdoch talked to Watts and, and got me, got me booked. And they, you know, I spent the previous summer as a referee in, in, in the Amarillo territory. And you, and you learn a lot just by being the third man in the ring. You really do. And, uh, and of course, you know, because I grew up in the business and everything, you know, nobody, thought that I needed to, you know, you know, you know, I, I, I could bump, I could do the stuff. And so they just started me. And so, I mean, it, it was kind of like, <laughs> okay, kid, let's see what you got. And, um, so I started there in the, in mid South. Uh, and, um, so, um, Leroy McGurk has a daughter. And, uh, I think, you know, everybody, I mean, if you guys remember who Mike McGurk is, well, you know, back when I met her, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, there was a, uh, uh, there was a, a, a like a famous, uh, she was, a, um, um, I don't know if she was in any movies or what, but, but I mean, she just, she was just, she beautiful and, you know, and, and I, I saw Mike. And I mean, that's who she reminded me of. Mm -hmm. yeah, so anyway, now, um, and so, you know, like you start talking to somebody and, and, uh, you know, like one thing led to another and pretty soon Mike and I are dating. <laughs> and so when, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was, it was funny too, because I remember one night we were, we had had a show in, uh, I think Little Rock, Arkansas. And we were, I was riding, I was right driving or riding back to Tulsa with Bill Watts and, um, uh, a couple other guys. And, you know, I had, I had told Mike, I said, uh, you know, t tell me a place that's on along, along the way where I can have them drop me off and meet you there. Cause this was supposed to be a big secret, you know, of, us, of seeing each other. And so she, she gave me a place and said, okay. And so, uh, and, and so when we get to the place, you know, uh, Bill says, oh, well, is, is your ride here yet? And I said, not yet, but they'll be here. I said, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. We don't want, we don't, we don't want you to get lost. You know, I mean, you know, you know left, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, and your ride doesn't, doesn't show up. So, They'll show up. I'm, I'm sure of it. No, that's okay. We'll wait. Oh no! And I kept trying to, and they just finally started laughing. They said, "Look, 
you think it's a big secret, but everybody in this car knows that you're seeing Mike. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, you know it's like the only uh, and so uh, when I guess when Leroy heard about it, he went ballistic. He, I mean, he was like it. You, you got it. You, you, Jim Ross can tell the story much better than I can because he lived it. Now, Jim's working for the company at the time. And Jim at that time was just like a referee. Uh, but he also helped, you know, you know, Leroy, you know, get around and stuff like that. So you know, he said, he gets this call from Leroy. And he says, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to kill that no good SOB. And so, <laughs> so uh, Jim tells a story about, you know, having to get in the car with Leroy McGurk. You know, and and, and, I, and he's he's got like a thirty eight revolver, you know, and he's, and he's a blind guy, right? You know, he's got thirty eight revolver in his lap. Oh God! Yeah, you know, and he's like, you know, and he's smoking a cigar, and I said the cigar, you know, like one of the the, the thing, you know, like it, it it fell off and 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 hit him on the leg and kind of burned him, and you know, <laughs> and, and which threw the threw the gun on the floor or something. And he says, he says, I'm just I'm just now praying, so God, let me get let me make it through this ordeal. And uh, so they they show up, you know. Uh, I can't remember where we were, where we where we were at the time, but you know, uh, you know, you know, he, he was never going to find me anyway, you know. I mean, because all the boys and, and Murdoch, Murdoch, you know, he he got the big kick out of this. So so uh, all everything quiets down, and uh, so but we're wrestling in Tulsa, and whenever we wrestled in Tulsa. You know, uh, Leroy would, you know, have somebody bring him in the dressing room so I could, he could greet all the guys and and everything. And, and, and so they bring him in the dressing room and, you know, and everybody knows. But Dick Murdoch, he looks at me and uh, it's kind of like he's, he's, he's about to say, you know, hey, uh, Tommy. <laughs> 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 And I'm I'm looking at him, you know, like with my hands, like I'm praying, like don't do it, Murdoch. Don't don't you dare do it. And he just kept teasing that, and uh, finally lay where I left. But man, yeah. So it was it, it you know it was a hot deal for a while, um, and then uh, you know just that's just life, you know. And and, and and the other part of this story is that you know. Uh, my first marriage was in the, in the, in the crapper. And, um, you know, if that hadn't been the case, then I, you know, I wouldn't be seeing anybody, but, um, okay. At the time, I mean, I was, I guess illegally at the time I was still married, but you know, we weren't living together or seeing each other or, and we were in the midst of a divorce. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> And what what became of your uh, relationship with Mike? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of like you know, I, I I I left the territory, and um, you know, that was it. It was just kind of one of those deals. It was like, and actually, one of the things that I did that that I ne that never would have, you know, I'm a huge fan of Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. I think Elvis Presley. Uh, hands down is probably the single greatest and most renowned and well-known entertainer ever. Yep. I mean, pick a genre. And, uh, and she was a Mike and her, her whole family. I mean, uh, actually she told me that, you know, uh, her and her mother got to see Elvis in, in Vegas because the, the NWA, you know, annually has, a meeting for the the organization and all of the people in it you know and the heads the all the promoters that were you know part of the nwa would meet in las vegas you know like once a year and while were they, they were out there he happened to be in vegas and so uh you know she got to see him out there wow well so then you know while, while we're dating uh, you know she says elvis presley is coming to tulsa and um and it just it just worked out like and he was going to i think it was going to be on a uh like a saturday or a sunday I, I i can't remember what it was 
but I was going to be there. I was going to be in Tulsa. I mean, you know, to wrestle, you know, but maybe not on that day. I can't remember. Anyway, um, Mike, so Mike gets us tickets. Nice. To, to go. And so I got to see Elvis Presley live um, there. And, and what was funny was that apparently while they were out in, in, in and, I, and I didn't know this, but uh, Elvis was a huge wrestling fan. Really? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, they said that uh, in the old Memphis Coliseum, and I, I've only wrestled there a couple of times, you know, it's like, if you look up, there's a cat, there's a catwalk way up at the top. And that catwalk goes out all the way to like, right, right in the middle of the building. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like crosses there. And you could sit up there and, and be looking down and, and have the best seat in the house for a wrestling match. And they said that they had done that. They, they snuck even, they snuck Elvis into the building and, and put him way up on that catwalk. And you, if you look up, I mean, it's, it's far enough up that you couldn't tell who, you know, you know, unless you had binoculars, you know, <laughs> right? Hey, who's that up there to, you know, <laughs> but Elvis actually watched the show from, from that viewpoint uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Here's where I'm going. Mm-hmm. So, we we go and see Elvis, and we had pretty good seats. And and you know, you know, in this show, it's like you ever if you ever watched the, there's a, a a documentary on him about when they started going on tour, and they were like 15, 15 days, fifteen cities, and things like that. And and the the way the you know like the the way the show opened and everything. Uh, and I, I I experienced all that. So apparently. Uh, Mike noticed Mike McGurk noticed one of the one of the one of, what do you call them uh, the guys that that set up and tear down and all that stuff that traveled with them oh like a, roadies a, a roadie and and so she she recognized one of the guys and, you know and like and waved at him and you know he he responded and so he. She, she just ran up there and talked to him for a minute. And so she comes back and he says, okay, they're staying at the whatever hotel, you know, and, you know, obviously they've got the whole top floor and we, we have the password to get in. Whoa. So I'm going, holy shit. I'm going to, I'm going to get to meet Elvis Presley. <laughs> so, the, the concert was the greatest of all time and everything. And I don't know what it is. I, I don't know what caused this flare up between Mike and I, but we got in the biggest damn fight about something. I have, I can't even remember what it was, but because of that fight, we didn't go. Oh yeah, man. Yeah. No kidding. Brutal. So you could have met Elvis if I you hadn't gotten into a fight. Yeah. Damn, I was, yeah. I'd have buried that hatchet quick. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, no, incredible. Anyway. So that that story is something I've heard about here and there. I've never really heard the full story, but yeah. uh, man, that's so uh, well uh, above and beyond expectations. That was yeah. great. Uh, next up, we've got Aldo who asks, you were there for a lot of the drama between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Did you see any of it backstage? And what did you think about it when you heard about the Montreal screw job? Uh, you know, the, I, you know, I was never eyewitness to any, any, any confrontation, any confrontation between the two. And, uh, um, the Montreal screw job, I, re- I remember it. I just don't remember all the details. So, uh, in a nutshell, Bret Hart uh, had been asked to drop the belt to Shawn Michaels, but he didn't want to drop the belt to Shawn because of the backstage issues the two of them have been having. He was like, I'll drop it to anybody else. And also, of course, it's in Montreal, so it's Canada. So, Bret didn't want to drop the belt in Canada. So, he was like, I will drop it to anybody else, or we can do it the, you know, the following night on Raw. He was like, but I'm not dropping the belt to him here in, in Canada. And yeah. so, uh, Shawn Michaels winds up getting him in a sharpshooter. And Vince has the timekeeper ring the bell, yeah. and and that's it. So they kind of screwed Brett out of the belt, and that was Brett's last match 
in the WWE. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's a lot of people are like kind of on either side where they're like, well, Sean was just a menace backstage and he, he created that problem. And then uh, guys like Jake Roberts say like, Hey, Bret Hart should have just done business and uh, it's not right that he did that. So what's your take on it? I, I, I agree 100% with Jake, you know, it's, it's business is business. I mean, I, Irregardless of your uh, personal feelings about somebody, uh, you know, when it comes to business, it's like, you know, people go to work every day, right? And I'm sure that there are people that go to work every day and they have to work with people that they don't necessarily like Mm -hmm. or they don't think much of. But business is business. And while you're doing business, take care of business and then go your separate way. You know, and if you don't want to be around the guy, you don't have to be around the guy. And so, you know, Jake was just right. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think Jake's, Jake hit it right on the head. When you're asked to do something in the business, you know, it's, it's, it's business. So, you know, do it. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, um, um, you know, just because you, you know, was, I, I maybe was it because he was in, in Canada and he would rather, not drop the belt in Canada or something because he's Canadian. Uh, I don't know. But again, uh, we all have to do things. It's just what's, uh, what was it? Uh, I'm trying to think who said it. He said, uh, it might have, it might have been Vince. <laughs> it was like, you know, uh, there are times when all of us have to sometimes eat a shit sandwich. <laughs> you know, you know, you just, you know, you just don't have a choice. Yeah, Jake actually uh, has. He said on our podcast, he was like, "Do you think that I liked everybody that I worked with?" He was like, "Absolutely not." He was like, "But if I, I it's a job. It's just yeah. like any other job. So it's, it's like you exactly." Know, I think a lot of people get into their head about like, "Oh, well, I'm a performer, and this doesn't match with my character or whatever thing." It's at yeah. the end of the day, it's like, "Hey, you've got a job. You have a boss that asks you to do something. Just do it." Yeah, exactly. Uh, JP Crawford up next. What was your most embarrassing moment during a match and why? Hmm. Wow. You ever like wipe out or like, you know, I, I hear a lot and Jake and I just talked about this one not long ago that it's kind of a common thing in pro wrestling for guys to shit themselves because because you're getting slammed. Maybe you're not feeling well. Um, you know, so it's, I don't know, anything like that ever happened to you? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. I was, I can't remember where, where we were and it doesn't matter where we were, but I, you know, and that's the other thing is like, you know, the show must go on and whether you're sick, you know, unless you're on your deathbed, you you know, (laughs) if you can get to the ring, you got to go. Right. And, and I, you know, and I was sick. I mean, sick enough that I was, you know, I was throwing up in the, you know, in the, in the toilet, in the, in the locker room. And, uh, but when it came time to go to the ring, I went to the ring and there were, uh, there were a couple times where I actually, you know, uh, had him throw me out. And I, I actually, at one time I rolled under the ring where nobody could see me and I threw up under the ring. <laughs> My God. <laughs> yeah. I threw up under the ring and then I, I rolled back out and, and, uh, and got going again. And, uh, yeah, I did, uh, I did squirt my pants that night, but it, it wasn't, it was kind of like, it's one of those things. If that's ever going to happen to you, you don't, you don't want it to be the, uh, the rush the like the, Oh, oh my God. You know, it's like, you know, it's like if, if it's just a little bit, you know, that it, 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 you know, it, it was, it was, it was actually hideable, you know, and you know, and it's hard to hard to hide anything like that when you, <laughs> what you're wearing isn't much anyway. <laughs> right. so, when you're just down to trunks, yeah, my God. Oh gosh, yeah, it was like, yeah, I was so glad to get back to the dressing room, and, you know. Uh, Mick Foley talked about it once before, too, and he said, uh, and this is an exact quote from Mick, he said, if you don't poop your pants in the ring every once in a while, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, next up, we've got Logan Smith who asks, while traveling in the lux luxurious style as a million dollar man, was there any one trip that stood out more than the others because of the mode of travel um, and everything being taken care of by the company? Any one trip really stick out for you, Ted? Uh, not not really. Um, you know, the, uh, I have to tell you that the trips that I re that I remembered more than when I was wrestling is when I went back to work. When I went back to work for the the company, as um, I was well, I was working in the office. I, I don't know what you how what you would classify as me. like an agent. Yeah, more or less. I mean, but I mean, it wasn't just the agents only showed up at the shows. Mm. You know, uh, this was me. Um, me working with a group of writers. Okay, so when you were part of the creative team, part part of, when I was part of the creative team, um, so you go to we would go to TV, right? We'd go to TV, and we would back then we did TV once every three weeks. We do three shows in one night, in one in one venue, and then something that was drivable, you know, the next day. Um, to the second venue and then you know after after the second venue three more shows then the guys who were wrestling would just continue their 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 uh tour well i was being as part of the creative team i got on the private jet and flew back to stanford with vince all right that's pretty cool C. Smith is up next. Do you wish you could have spent some time as a baby face in WWE? What heels would you have liked to work with? <laughs> you know, um, it's funny, but, you know, once I became the heel, I just, I just loved it. I loved it, you know, because it was so different. And I mean, it's like I'm being, a, it's almost like being a total different person. It's like you turn it on and you, and you turn it off. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, not to mention the fact that, you know, as a heel, and that was still, I don't know what, what it's, I'm not there anymore, so I don't know how they look at things, but traditionally, the heel is the guy in the match who's calling it. He's telling, he's this, I mean, step by step, if you will. Uh, and there are some, some guys, obviously, who have enough respect for each other that they, you know, okay, they, they do it together. And mm -hmm. I've, I've had matches like that, you know, like Jake and I, when we worked together, you know, you know, we both called it, you know, um, and, uh, I never envisioned being a baby face. I mean, it was just, that was a, that was a spot that, cause you know, I don't know, you got like, you've, you've got one guy usually that is like in, in like in the early nineties, Hulk Hogan was the guy. Yes, he was the guy, and and then Vince just kept fit, feeding him heels, you know. And I was one of those heels, but it was a, I was a heel that, you know, it's like you can't always be right at the top. Now again, you know, Hogan had his run there, whoever that guy is. And again, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, baby faces are, uh, you know. Uh, they you say they they can come and go, but but a good heel, you know, he could stay for a long time. Yeah, and Hogan is at the top of this mountain as a baby face, so yeah. it's like okay, so you're not going to be the top baby face if you're a baby face. So your your options are you can either be a, a lower car lower on the card as a baby face, or you can work in the main event as a heel. Yeah, exactly. So so yeah, it's pretty pretty hard to beat that gig. And um, you know, and the way Vince moved us around, I mean, you know, I was you know, and of course like. And, you know, and my run, my run as a heel was pretty long. I mean, I, I think it was pro probably longer than most. I mean, I remember Bruce Pritchard and I talking about it. And, you know, when they, they said, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to move you to uh, maybe a, a tag team. I said, golly, a tag team. He says, well, man, he says, you, you know, you've been riding the, the rail at the top here for a long time. He says, need to do you know i think they want to do something different and that's when they tagged me up with mike rotunda 
And it was it was legitimately 10 straight years that you were a heel Um, because you came into the WWF as a heel in 87. And then you didn't turn babyface until 97 when you got paired up with the Steiners. So uh, you that's that's a hell of a heel run. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now, uh, I mean, he did also ask something interesting here. As a heel, you have to work against baby faces back in those days. So you missed opportunities to work with a a lot of guys who were heels. Like a a guy that sticks out for me is, you know, Ric Flair came there in 91, 92. You didn't get to work with him uh, in the WWF on a huge stage because you were also a heel. So is there anybody else but out there? I, but I did work with Rick. I mean, when uh, Rick was the, the champion, uh, you know, and of course the champion, the NWA world champion, the only place he was ever a, a baby face would be Charlotte, where we were. That was his home. Mm-hmm. That was his home territory. And I'm not even sure that that would, you know, that he would have been a, a baby face there. But I know for the most part, like the Funks, uh, the Funks were baby faces because they lived there. That was their territory. They owned it. Right. You know, uh, you know, so, um, um, that's where they were baby faces everywhere else. They wrestled when they were champion, they were a heel because it's like the territories would, they're, 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 they, 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 they're, they would build a guy up. That, you know, like you see the guy make the climb, you know, the good guy that you you root for. And he, you know, he's knocking them off and he finally, you know, and he finally beats the top heel in the territory and, and, and whatever. And so, and, the, and, and of course that story could go on a, a longer or if not, but then when whoever the, the NWA world champion came in, he came in to face the top baby face. Cause that's going to be the biggest draw. Yes. It only makes sense. It's like, okay, the world champion's coming in to re- wrestle uh, uh, Magdog, Magdog Fashan, who is always a heel. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any sense. But if that, ba- but if that baby face, I mean, that heel, you know, even if he's not a heel, the world champion, you put him in the ring with any, any, any baby face on the, in the territory he's automatically going to be a heel because the, 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 the hometown crowd is, is going to cheer for their guy. Right. So, you know, that's what you tried to make happen all the time. Interesting dynamic. And uh, yeah, interesting. All the, all the, con- the possible combinations that were out there that, you know, yeah, you did get yeah. to work with Rick, but it's, you know, thinking about you as the million dollar man working with Rick Flair. I don't know. That, that just seems fascinating to me. I don't well, and I don't think we you know we didn't work we didn't work in the WWF uh, no. I don't think at all but I but prior to that and I think um I know in Amarillo uh, I think we did and I think in Georgia uh, but we had a few matches but I loved I mean Rick was so easy oh my gosh yeah it was like doing a dance um Dr Legend has got kind of a related question Who's the one opponent you dream to work a program with that never came into fruition? Anybody Man. stick out? Uh, I can't really, you know, think of anybody off the top of my head that I mean. Uh, well, I, I mean, again, Ric Flair. If if I had, you know, I, I again we wrestled a time or two, you know, but. I never had a program with Rick. Mm-hmm. Um, um, uh, Bret Hart and I, you know, uh, we we wrestled one time, mm-hmm. and we tore the house down. And we, you know, that's there's a guy that I only got to wrestle one time, and I would love to have been able to have a program with uh, with Bret um, again because we came from the same psychology of the business. Yes. you know, what, what, it, what it is, you know, and we were both you know, like workers. It was like, you know, it was kind of like, uh, you know, watching a movie, you know, we could, we could both tell a story. And, um, so Brett was one of those guys. Um, another, yeah. another name I'll throw out there for a program would be you and Shawn Michaels would be something else. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I worked with Sean when he was, you know, I, probably when he right when he first started 
when he was in the dress. The first time I saw him was in the dressing room at Mid, Mid South when he came in to to work for Bill Watts. Did you when ever? He, did you see the the potential in him to rise to the main event? Um, I oh, I did. Yeah, I, I did. You know, I mean, I not I never saw him. I didn't get the opportunity to see him interview much at the time because he was brand new and he wasn't. He wasn't in another spot where he would be interviewed. Yeah. Right. Just an just an enhancement talent whenever you worked with yeah. him. Yeah. But uh yeah, he had he had it. All right, we'll do a couple more and then we'll get out of here, Ted. Instagram a wrestling historian asks, Can you tell us about your time on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Thanks in advance. <laughs> Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. It's just this is crazy. Um I, so I, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people have seen this show and, 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 uh, but when they came to me and they said, we're going to put you on lifestyles, of the rich and famous. And this is, this is Vince trying to make the public believe I'm really that guy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I did a, I did a segment of lifestyles of the rich and famous and you see me traveling, uh, in my limousine and you see me. You know, you see me pull up to this this lavish home and 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 you know and and and, and kind of take you on a tour of, of the house. It was Vince's house. <laughs> it was the boss's house. That's where <laughs> that's where we did lifestyles of the rich and famous. <laughs> and of course, nobody knew that at the time, you know. But yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't even know if Vince still lives in that location, but um, probably not because he's, you know not a married guy anymore so he's he's got the money to move just about wherever he wants to oh yeah um you know vince's house has become almost like lore among wrestling fans because you know we always would hear uh, over the years that like uh talents that vince had a lot of respect for really saw potential in and yeah. whenever they would sign the contract he'd bring them to his house to negotiate yeah. and sign the contract yeah. they also did like a lot of creative meetings and stuff there whenever you were negotiating the contract with vince were you brought to the house I well, I, I I did go to his house a couple of times, but it wasn't necessarily at that time. It's kind of like, uh, um, because when we first when we first met, um, you know, the other guy in that meeting was Pat Patterson, mm -hmm. because Pat was uh, Vince's right hand man at the time and knew you from your previous run. Oh oh yeah, uh, and. Um, and I'm sure I'm sure that it's Pat that probably put me over to Vince a lot because he had seen, you know, I guess my potential. When he first presented it to me, it was in the office with the, mm -hmm. the, the, the idea, the concept and everything. And I didn't want to be too uh, quick, you know, jump in the, you know, and I, and, I, and I wanted to go run it all by Terry Funk, who was my kind of like my mentor. I ran everything by him. And so um, I left that first meeting and said, well, you know, I, I, I you know, I just got to think about this and uh, I'll get back to you. And so he said, good. And so then when I talked to Terry, Terry said, if he's got something that he thinks is made for you and your, you know, what you have to offer, he says, go, man, he says, don't look back. He says, that's the place to be now. That's where wrestling's going. And so I called Vince back and I said, okay, um, I'm your guy. Now, now tell me what it was, what it is. He wouldn't tell me on the phone. He said, nope, he said, I'm flying you back up here. <laughs> so, so he flies me and my wife back up to New York. And uh, while I'm in signing the contract with him, Melanie's out, uh, you know, being entertained by the, the secretaries. And so then uh, he said, uh, here's the deal. He says, uh, uh, we look forward to working with you. He says, the limousine is waiting for you and your wife. Uh, we have reserved a room for you at the Helmsley Palace in Manhattan. All right. Which is, yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, like plush. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, and uh, in other words, it's like you know, like you know, 
it's it's you know like uh, I think we we had a we had a dinner reservation at a place I can't remember the name of it, but my gosh, it was some of the best food I've ever eaten in my life. And uh, and then uh, we had we had dinner, and then and then basically he says, and you know, there's several, you know, like you know, shows in town. Uh, there's always like a you know a theatrical presentation, you know, stage show. And he says, you know, pick one you like, and it's yours. He says, and, and you know, and of course, and that's when the girl comes out and counts out the hundred dollar bills. And he said, uh, "Welcome to the team, and uh, go start being the million dollar man." Is your wife like okay? Uh, oh, we, oh, we made I, the right oh, move. <laughs> well, when I got back in the car with her, I said, "You're not going to believe this." And I said, "You know, you know, the the our ship has finally sailed." <laughs> and so and the rest is history so next thing you know she's seeing you as an action figure in in walmart <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah couple more and we're done ted have you covered his oh i'm sorry this one's from dan ochoa have you covered his theme music yet i'd like to know the background on how his theme came to be ted did they just give it to you or did you have to select it or how did it work uh you know the guy who wrote most of the theme music for our era was um uh, jim johnston no no um well maybe uh jimmy hart jimmy hart i mean jimmy hart used to be in a band you know they were a one hut wonder i can't remember the name of that that song the gentries but yeah he was the, the gentries uh mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, it was Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy did my song, man. It was absolutely perfect. Couldn't have possibly fit your character better. <laughs> uh, all right. Last one. And then we're, we're getting out of here. Ted, Sean Conover asks, what was your favorite match of all time? It's a simple one, but I'm interested to hear the answer. You know, to wrestle with a lot of the talent, that I have wrestled, it's hard for me to, to zero in on one match. I mean, you got to understand, I wrestled, you know, you know, there's 31 days in a, in a, in a month and 21 of those days, at least I was wrestling every night. Man. Um, but, um, there are key figures. Number one, when I first began, uh, the guys who helped me a lot, Dick Murdoch, Killer Carl Cox. Um, these are guys that I had, you know, great respect for, and they were greatly talented. Um, uh, I mean, Cowboy Bill Watts, I never wrestled Cowboy, but the influence and my under his understanding of the psychology of wrestling you know, I, I, I go, gosh, you know, I'm so glad I started there with, with Bill and I kept going back to him because I respected him so much. Um, but, uh, Jake, you know, Jake and I, you know, we, we had, a we had a little, you know, it wasn't long enough to me. I would have shoot, man. I, you know, I, I could have worked with Jake every night, you know, uh, because, you know, same deal. We came from the same background. Jake and I recently talked about Mid-South, July 1985 on our podcast, and that included a match between the two of you at WrestleFest 1985, an outdoor show at Skelly Field in Tulsa. Yeah. And so uh, that card included Dusty Rhodes versus Ric Flair. That card had uh, Dutch Mantel working on it, like a lot of really big names on that card, and unanimously in all of the reviews, it was you and Jake stole the show at that. Yeah. Yeah, so I yeah, mean, and, incredible and, chemistry. And well, yeah, uh, and and all of that comes from the fact that you know we again we understood each other because we came from the same type of background. Mm -hmm. We came from a background of 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 the the, the match is the show, and so you know it's kind of like I would I would watch matches that went on before me. And, you know, I, I tried intentionally not to do anything that they don't, the people had already seen if I could, if I couldn't help it, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just a different, different, you know, 
bygone era. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dad, I'm having fun revisiting <laughs> your your era yeah. uh, throughout your career. And gosh, there's a lot more to come. Uh, and actually, Dad, by the time our podcast our podcast next week comes out, it's going to be August, which means it's SummerSlam season. It also wow. marks the it also marks the anniversary of your debut in WCW and a bunch more stuff. So we've got a really big month coming up here on the show. Uh, before we say goodbye to everybody, I just want to remind you that if you'd like to get this podcast on video with no commercials and get access to a ton of sports, entertainment, and other shows, you've got to get over to PremierStreamingNetwork.com and sign up for Premier Plus. If you're a wrestling fan, if you're a fan of sports in general, or if you're just looking for some great entertainment, you're guaranteed to love it over there. My brother does a podcast, Dominic D'Angelo. He does a podcast with RVD, and those two have a blast every single week. And they're constantly adding more fun material over there. So, guys, if you are a fan of pro wrestling, get over there. It's PremierStreamingNetwork.com. Sign up for Premier Plus today. If you're enjoying our show and you're listening on your podcast app, please take just a moment to like, subscribe, leave us a five-star review. Only takes you a second and does us a huge, huge favor. So if you're enjoying our show, you want us to keep doing it, just please get over there and give us a five-star review. That would be wonderful. Also, follow Ted at MDM Ted DiBiase on his social media. Follow me at Marcus P. D'Angelo on Twitter. Follow Premier Streaming Network at Watch on Premier on Twitter and at Premier Streaming Network on Instagram and Facebook. Ted, another excellent episode in the books today, my friend. Well, thank you so very much. And to all you fans out there, just don't ever forget. Everybody's got a price for the million dollar man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch you guys next week right here on Everybody's Got a Pod.